Dragon Quest was the first role-playing game to ever reach mainstream success in Japan. In fact, it was so successful that the Japanese would later refer to all role-playing games in this style as Dorakwa, which is a portmanteau word consisting of Dragon and Quest. This is similar to the western term Doom Clone, which was initially used for first-person shooters until it got replaced. Similar to how Doom became synonymous with first-person shooters without inventing them, Dragon Quest became synonymous with the Japanese style of RPGs. However, actually finding the very first RPG made in Japan is very difficult since not every game from that era has been preserved. Also, precise release dates are very hard to come by. Then there's the term role-playing game itself which causes a lot of problems. It's a hotly debated topic which games count as an RPG and which do not. I think this is due to different interpretations of what constitutes a role-playing game and that there may even be different meanings of this term that coexist and that aren't separated consequently enough. Because some people emphasize the role-playing aspect and require that such a game has to give the players freedom to act out a fictional role and provide meaningful choices. But this is very difficult to realize within a computer program, especially if it's a really old one, that is limited by the hardware of its time. Then there are some that put more emphasis on gameplay mechanics, such as status attributes, experience points, dungeon crawling and so on. By this time, another fatal flaw with the term role-playing game becomes obvious. None of these elements are exclusive to RPGs. For example, many adventure games provide more freedom to act out a role than the genre that has the word role-playing literally in its title. And as far as game mechanics are concerned, there are more and more games from other genres that take inspiration from RPG mechanics. Therefore, many modern action games make use of quests, level up systems, skill trees and so on. Some may even offer choices that affect the outcome of the story. On the other hand, modern RPGs take more and more inspiration from action games, blowing the line between the genres even further. As such, their distinction sometimes appears to be more a matter of ideology instead of objective analysis. This matter gets even more complicated if you take cultural differences into the equation. Up until roughly the mid-80s, the concept of what Westerners consider to be a roleplay game wasn't quite as well known in Japan. Some Japanese may have had contact with pen and paper RPGs such as Dungeons and Dragons or computer games such as Ultimate Wizardry that were based on D&D. But when it came to actually creating games in this style, it became obvious that they took a slightly different approach. To illustrate this phenomenon, I want to take a closer look at Chite Tanken by Koei Microsoft. To this day, the programmer of this game still prides himself on having created Japan's first role-playing game. I want to take a look at this game and try to find out if this really constitutes as an RPG. Chite Tanken means something like exploration of the depths of the earth and is probably a reference to the novel Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. However, the original novel is called Chite Lyoko in Japanese, which is a literal translation of the title. But there's a movie based on this book from 1959 and its title was changed to Chite Tanken. Therefore, I assume that this game was probably inspired by the movie of the same name. Chite Tanken was developed by Yoichi Erikawa, who previously had founded the company Koei Micom System with his wife Keiko Erikawa, in order to distribute and eventually also to develop games. His first game was Kawanakajima no Kassen, a strategy game set in the Sengoku era. It was released in 1981 on a cassette for the NEC PC-88. Shortly after, he developed four more games that back then were sold and marketed as simulation games. These games shared similar packaging and title artwork, which is why they became known as Koei no Akabako Shilizu, that is to say, Koei's Red Box series. This series enjoyed a good reputation among Japanese gamers since they were relatively well made and featured similar gameplay. Thanks to this, potential buyers knew what to expect from a game in the series. 
Yuichi Ilikawa released the games that he made or that his development teams would create later on under the moniker Shibusawa Ko. The name Shibusawa was inspired by Shibusawa Eiichi, a famous Japanese business magnate during the Meiji era. He was a huge inspiration to Yuichi Ilikawa. And finally, the name Ko derived from the first part of the company Koei and was written with a Chinese character for light. This alias would further create brand recognition and serve to instill trust in the customers. Chite Tankan was finally released in 1982 and sold for 4,500 N. There was supposedly a port for the FM7, but more detailed information are almost impossible to find. But what kind of game is Chite Tankan exactly? And does it really fit our understanding of an RPG? At least Yoichi Ilikawa seemed very sure of this, as he once stated in an interview. Anyway, the goal of this game is to escape several stages of an underground labyrinth and to loot a treasure chest at the very end. In order to achieve this, the player creates an adventurer party of up to six characters. This party consists of the protagonist and several mercenaries that can be hired out of a list of 10 characters. The names are always the same, but the status attributes are randomly generated at the beginning of every game. The status attributes consist of physical strength, injuries, daily wage, provisions and contract. Physical strength is similar to endurance in modern games as it decreases with every action that you take, especially running and fighting. Also, the terrain and difficulty affect how fast your physical strength will decrease. Injuries are actually the equivalent to hit points and you want them to be as high as possible, because if you get hit in battle and they reach zero, that character will permanently die. Daily wage and provisions determine how much money and food rations a character requires every day respectively. If a character is not carrying enough rations with them at the end of a day, they will lose 200 points of endurance, which might cause an early death. The attribute contract seems to be some kind of one of payment that has to be paid if you want to permanently get rid of a party member. So all in all, you would ideally want characters that require low daily wages and provisions while also featuring high physical strength and injuries attributes. The protagonist is unique in that they have more status attributes, that is to say, intelligence and courage. Intelligence is mostly used for looking at your map or using your computer, but it also affects the hit percentage of your ranged weapon. Courage also affects your hit percentage, but it is mostly used to determine your damage in close quarters combat. However, courage can only be restored by sleeping or by hitting an enemy with a rifle, but it decreases with every action. What will drain your courage the most, however, is difficult terrain, such as swamps and deserts. If either intelligence or courage reach zero, you will immediately encounter the game over screen. The same applies to the physical strength and injuries attributes of the protagonist. Attributes can be increased up to a maximum of 1000 by sleeping, resting, eating or using medicine. This maximum is fixed and cannot be increased any further throughout the adventure. Also, the damage of close quarter combat as well as the hit percentage and damage of ranged weapons depends solely on the protagonist's status attributes. They do not increase over the course of the adventure or after killing lots and lots of enemies. This means that your characters will not grow and are just as strong at the end of the adventure as they were in the beginning. Moreover, the number of party members and their status attributes do not have any influence on your combat prowess whatsoever. So in terms of combat, it makes absolutely no difference whether you're traveling with a minimum number of three characters or whether you have a full party of six. All of these should actually speak against this game being a typical RPG. And what are party members good for anyway? According to my experience, they only drain your resources faster and their only benefit is acting as a meat shield for your protagonist so that you can hopefully keep your combat prowess longer during a fight. Due to your status attributes constantly going down, this game reminded me personally more of a survival game, 
which is all about resource management and where even a single mistake can cause an untimely death. Another thing to note in Chite Tanken is the time is passing with every action. Therefore, you have to decide carefully on which action to take, because with every passing day, your characters require both food and money. But it's not just that. There are no random encounters, but instead enemies are randomly scattered across every floor of the dungeon and they constantly move towards you whenever time passes. So it can happen that enemies surprise and kill you while sleeping, especially since your characters do not wake up when attacked. There are a variety of actions that you can take during the game. Move allows you to move up to 10 times per hour in various directions. The movement speed depends on the weight of your equipment. You can also take a look around to gather more precise information about the surrounding terrain. Alternatively, you can take a look at the map of the entire floor that you're currently on. Here everything is shown on a grid, with letters denoting the rough location of various points of interest or terrain types. For example, S stands for deserts, W for swamps and M for villages. However, this position information is very imprecise since every dot or letter on the grid stands for an area consisting of 200 by 200 meters and the specific terrain type or point of interest may be somewhere within that large area. The map of an average dungeon floor consists of roughly 10 by 10 points, which amounts to 2000 by 2000 meters. Now consider that you can move up to 10 times during a movement phase and every time you do move, you can move 10 meters at most. That means that the maximum movement speed amounts to 100 meters per hour. Apart from being extremely unrealistic, this should show that the individual dungeon floors are extremely huge. And they grow even bigger and more complex the higher the difficulty setting is. This makes it extremely difficult to search for specific points of interest, such as a gold mine that usually measures 80 by 40 meters. Now also consider that whenever you look on your map or take a look at your immediate surroundings, a full hour will pass. And looking at the large map even costs 100 intelligence points, meaning that you could theoretically die from looking at your map. Let's move on to the battle commands. You have two battle commands available. One is shooting with a rifle at opponents that are roughly 200 meters away from you. The other is close quarters combat, which is potentially stronger as it allows you to attack approximately 5 times per turn. However, during close quarters combat, your status attributes will decrease very quickly, causing you to inflict less damage every time. Moreover, enemies can retaliate at close range, but they do not have a ranged attack which makes fighting from a distance much safer. While playing on lower difficulty, it doesn't really matter how you choose to fight against enemies and you can recklessly rush into close quarters combat since enemies deal hardly any damage at all. But as soon as you get to even medium difficulty, every encounter is potentially deadly, so that it's preferable to keep your distance from enemies. On the highest difficulty of 9, even a single hit can cost you up to 90% of your maximum hit points. Therefore, I highly recommend a hit and run tactic where you shoot at enemies from a distance and then quickly run away before they come too close. This works especially well when you are in a village or an oasis since enemies can't attack you here. They will gather at your spot on the map, but they somehow can't attack you. This way, you can safely restore your status attributes, then run away from the village or oasis, shoot at enemies and retreat back into safety before they come too close. You can just repeat this procedure until all enemies on a dungeon floor are dead as they will not respawn. The monsters themselves are pretty unusual as they do not correspond to the typical RPG stereotypes. That is to say, you are fighting against kaiju such as Godzilla, Mothra and Rodan. The difficulty setting determines how many of each type there can be on any of the dungeon floors. If you shoot at the monsters, you can even see a short battle animation featuring a stick figure shooting a rifle at one of those monsters. The enemies may look simplistic, but they do represent their inspirations quite faithfully. 
This makes it even more incredible to me that they could get away with such blatant copyright infringements. As for other game commands, you can also heal your party with medicine, take a rest or sleep. Sleeping can take anything between 1 and 9 hours and can only be used once per day. However, sleeping is the best method to restore your status attributes and one of the very few methods to restore your courage. I hope it's become obvious that you have to plan your actions carefully while maneuvering the terrain, recovering your party and fighting against monsters. Meanwhile, the clock is ticking mercilessly and with every passing day you will lose precious food rations and money. But how can you stock up on food rations or money? For this you can visit villages of the indigenous people, of which there is at least one per floor. Upon reaching one of those underground villages, you are able to access the trading screen for a fee of $1000. This allows you to buy and sell goods such as food or medicine. You can also sell gold in order to obtain more cash money. Every time you access the trading screen, the available items as well as the prices will be randomly generated. Theoretically, you could make a fortune just by buying and reselling items once you have obtained the necessary funds making it potentially unnecessary to arduously search for gold. But at the beginning of the game, you will need to find and mine gold in order to increase your limited funds and provide for your party's needs. But how do you even find gold? For this, you will have to search the map for spots that are marked by the letter G, which indicate gold mines. Upon finding a gold mine, it will tell you how much ore you can dig up and also the purity of the ore. This means that for every 100 kg of ore that you dig up, you will obtain a certain amount of gold in gram. These values are randomly generated for every gold mine. Moreover, mining for gold exhausts a lot of endurance. For every 100 kg of ore, you lose 100 points of endurance which means that you might have to take frequent pauses in order to recover. Unfortunately, only the protagonist loses endurance, which is a poor design decision in my opinion. This is because having more party members will drain your money and food much quicker without any positive effect on battles. Meanwhile, your capacity to mine for gold is always the same as it solely depends on your protagonist. Thus a small party is much more advantageous. It would have only been fair if the loss of endurance points had been split among your party members to compensate for the higher maintenance cost. Overall, I am of the opinion that this game had many interesting ideas and that it was very complex and expansive for its time. But unfortunately, the many interlocking systems are not that well balanced, creating some sort of imbalance in the game. At first it was overwhelmingly difficult and stressful as I was fighting against the clock and my ever dwindling resources, not to mention the many enemies. But as my understanding of this game's mechanics deepened, I learned to use it to my advantage, thus removing much of the challenge and making the game fairly boring and repetitive. Because once I had found a winning strategy, every floor of the dungeon would basically work out the same way. The only difference on higher difficulties was that the dungeon had more floors and each floor became significantly bigger and featured more enemies as well. But since the general flow of the game always remained the same, it just became long-winded and tedious. Moreover, I'm missing some sort of progression. In a typical role-playing game, the characters would grow stronger over time and be able to deal with enemies and obstacles more effectively. But the characters in this game do not really change over time, so that the first and the last floor of the dungeon play out virtually the same. While this caused me to eventually get bored, I still greatly appreciate how this game captured me for quite a long time, despite being a very limited game from 1982. There was however another thing that greatly disappointed me, maybe even more than anything else, and that is the ending. All you get is a screen of an empty chest and a message that looks more akin to an error message. It does not even matter how well you perform during the adventure. Just a single overview over your earnings and maybe a congratulatory message would have been great as an acknowledgement for your achievements. Luckily, Kuei would fix this in later games such as Dragon and Princess. I greatly appreciate this kind gesture.
but coming back to the introductory question, we still have not answered whether GTA Tankan is actually a proper role playing game. At least its developer, Yoichi Idekawa, is convinced that his creation deserves the title of the first Japanese role playing game. As for the literal interpretation of this term, there is little actual playing of a role in GTA Tankan. As for the game mechanics usually associated with RPGs, there are quite a few already present, such as freely creating an adventuring party, as well as turn based battles that are based on status attributes and percentages. There are also a few available items like medicine, food rations, gold and cash money, and even a rudimentary economy, even if goods and prices are merely randomly generated. However, there are no weapons, pieces of armor or equipment. And as mentioned earlier, there is also no character progression, so that the characters are still the same at the end of the game. Do these points justify calling GT Tankan a role-playing game? To be honest, I am not quite sure. I am leaning towards yes, but at the same time, I do not feel very comfortable doing so. Because this game might as well have been influenced by board games or simulation games. Any similarities to proper role playing games might just be a coincidence, and it could have been that it was only called a role playing game retrospectively. Alternatively, one might consider this game to be some sort of proto RPG. There is to say an early adaptation or example of this genre that does not yet quite fulfill all requirements associated with RPGs. But then again, this really depends on your definition of what makes an RPG. As I was looking for clarification on this issue, I stumbled upon the blog of the CRPG addict who described his criteria for what makes an RPG. According to him, a game has to fulfill at least two of the following criteria in order to fall into the RPG category. A. There must be items that are not just required to solve puzzles. B. The characters must be able to gain levels and develop over the course of the game. And C. Battles must depend at least partially on status attributes. If the battles depend solely on the dexterity or twitch reflexes of the player, then it does not count towards being an RPG. As mentioned earlier, GT Tankan fulfills two of these three categories, even if I had not explicitly stated them as such. So based on this definition, GT Tankan could be considered a proper RPG. Thus, we can tentatively agree with Yoichi Ilikawa's claim that GTA Tankan is indeed the first RPG developed in Japan.